Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new Film Music Media Conversation. I'm Kaya Savas and I'm here sitting with the amazing Jeff Rousseau. Jeff, how are you doing, sir? It's been a while since we've uh, since we've talked. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. glad to see you. And yes, it's been a while, been a, a couple of years at least. Yeah, Maybe it's been, moved. been a while, yeah. So you're no longer in your old studio space, so you got... Well, no, I've I've moved. I've moved to a new studio, and uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting that that's happened over the last year. So, um, as things sort of started coming out of the wood, you know, coming out of the the last couple of years of the pandemic, and you know, things started to change, and so yeah, new studios, new work, new things, new stuff to do. Absolutely. So. Uh... Uh, for 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 today's conversation, I know so for anyone listening or watching, you know Jeff and I have a whole library of uh, different interviews in the past. If you want to take a look at Jeff's kind of career start and early projects, we go we can go check those out. But we're going to dive in for this uh, this episode. We're going to talk about uh, Mrs. Davis, Love and Death, Snowfall, and some recent stuff you've been uh, working on and what's coming up. Um, but to uh, kick off our chat, maybe we'll talk about just kind of. Some general topics and i always i've been asking since last time we've talked i've started asking composers this question um to kind of kick off the conversation so however you take this question uh however you process it or 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 kind of analyze it or see it uh, as a as a person as a as an artist as a storyteller as a human being uh what does music mean to you wow um you know it's interesting you know music has so many different meanings in different contexts they it means different things so yeah you know, for me, in the context of telling stories, narrative, like, you know, to in terms of film and television and even to a certain degree, video games, um, you know, music sort of represents the heart of any story. I think it's really the fastest way to get from, you know, the storytelling right to the emotion and right. And 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 if that's the objective. Right. Um, but it really does always sort of guide the viewer and listener for that matter in in feelings so you know in terms of this particular conversation i i think that music is really the heart of any sort of storytelling that's what it means to me i mean you know other than that music has so many other meanings to me like as i listen to music and i'm reminded of times when i was young and there's nostalgia and there's yeah. all kinds of things but at at the at the heart of it it really is um you know, emotion and feeling yeah. and the heart of of whatever it is. So, you know, I was driving in the car and I, I heard a song that, you know, I remember the first time I, I ever heard it when I was 14 years old. And it really brought me back to that mm -hmm. moment. And even though that sounds sort of trite, I mean, it it's so true. It is yeah. very true. Um, and I, I don't know. I, that that's that's really how I feel about music. Music is is um, heart and soul. Yeah, it's it's it is strange. Like I mean, I guess not strange, but it is unique because I still listen to stuff that I listened to as a kid. And when you, it's like when you start listening to that, whether even if it's a movie or a piece of music or a book or a video game or something you played when you were younger, it's like you, your brain like bridges the gap of all those years and just kind of connects those two points in time strangely. And it's just like. You're an adult, but you you remember those moments as a kid or when you were younger, and it's uh it has that powerful effect. Yeah, it's it's something that I think that all great storytelling and art or expression you know connects with us for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know you you of course your career spans so many different genres, so many different uh tight you know mediums from television to film and all everything in between. So uh, but you know I think we're going to be talking a lot about television today. So I'm curious um, for you as a composer. What is what what appeals to you from long form storytelling, whether it's a mini series or you know a constant series uh, with multiple seasons? That's maybe uh, gives something to you as a storyteller that's different than a film, which is more you know concise. Everything has to be done within two to two and a half hours. Well, you know, I can I can really um, explore thematic material with mm. when there's ten episodes or eight episodes as opposed to a movie. Um, I really get to experience explore it and expand on it as opposed to trying to figure out what it is in a very short amount of time and then doing that um with fargo in particular i get to <clears throat> i get to really develop themes yeah. um 
you know, they can start in one place and end in another. And you can do that in film and even to even in video games, um, perhaps even more in video games, because usually video games is a lot longer of a, of a story. Um, but that's what I would say about really enjoying the long form aspect of television. Now, not all television is like that. Some episodic television is very much like individual stories happening all the sure. time. Um, and my just trying to find that through line is also really interesting to me. Um, you know, certainly that happens in, in Star Trek um, where we've been telling different stories, um, you know, with with Discovery, it's been like season long arcs with a sort of an eye on a really super long arc. Same happened in Picard where there was this you know, th there's the idea of these characters that right. certainly have this whole story, but there was definitely a story for season one, season two, and and of course now season three, which has taken a completely sort of uh, the approach of going back to um, where the series, the original series had left off, um, or at least the original series films right, <laughs> had, right. had left off. Um, but so the, the interesting part of that is how to connect all of these stories with music. And not try to like tell a story and then be done with it and then tell another story, but to to really feel like it's all of a piece. That that to me is is an interesting puzzle to try to solve. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, so I think television has also been where some of the great storytelling. I know we've I feel like we've been talking about this golden age of TV for like 10 years now, but I it's still I think the case where where I think creators and writer, you know, writers themselves, like you know, screenwriters and 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 showrunners, can really flex certain things and find certain things and mesh with genres. I feel like genre bending is such a, you know, especially if we're talking about you know, Mrs. Davis. We'll talk about that, but just like exploring different things. And I'm curious, uh, you know, what do you see as the state of television today as compared to ten years ago? And where do you think it's going? Especially, you know, especially with all the change. I mean, we don't even have to acknowledge all the change happening in business side of the industry, but like, where do you think it's moving towards and how has it changed? Well, I think storytelling has become more complex. I, I yeah. think that that has really changed how we tell stories in this particular medium. And that, I, I don't know, I think, I think it started more than 10 years ago. I think it may have started 25 yeah, yeah. years ago, might've started 25 years ago. Really. To me, when when they started telling the story, the the Sopranos, the Sopranos really changed how I watched television. Yeah. Right. It, it wasn't it wasn't that it maybe changed the 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 way people were telling stories, but how I watched it and how they were able to take this character and expand on on a character's um, life and development over a long period of time. I think that was. That was more than the what they had done before in that particular genre of storytelling. And I think that that sort of changed the next thing that came and the next thing that came. And and really, you know, that that's the idea. The idea of, I think, us as artists and, and filmmakers is how, how can we do the thing that we just did better the next time? Right. Um, you know, and I, I think that you you really do see that happening. You re, You really see like, relationships and and character storytelling getting more and more complex and yet also simple you know i in the last 3 days i've watched the series finales of two different shows two so they're so different yet they're so simple and complex at the same time you know i'm i'm, I'm actually specifically talking about succession and ted lasso oh, so ted lasso. two I mean, two shows that literally could not be any different, right? Yeah. But in the end, they're also quite similar because they, they really are talking about the frailty of, of the human spirit and also the temerity of the human spirit and like how how character how character storytelling is in fact the most important thing. It's really yeah. about the characters. And both those stories had really, really, really incredibly complex and incredibly detailed um, character building in, in both those shows. Um, and I think that, you know, in terms of how things are changing um, with television, I think 
that's the direction. It just keeps mm -hmm. getting better. Like the, the, and sure, there's always a dud somewhere <laughs> amongst the, amongst the, um, amongst the fray, but, you know, I really do think it's going in that direction. And that makes what I do and what we do as, as musicians, a, a, you know, in terms of, of how we help tell the story, it makes it even more important and interesting to do. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I, Succession was uh, a wild one to see how they wrapped up. And then uh, I haven't, I need to catch up on Ted Lasso. I'm a little bit behind, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of, you know, that show. But I also finished Barry, which also ended just in the most unique and completely different right. too. And the way they close up, you know, everything and what Bill Hader did is, 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 is absolutely uh, crazy. And, um, but um, I mean, that's a good jumping off point. We can jump into some of, uh, some of your television works, the recent stuff that you've worked on. And, and maybe we can start with, you know, we were talking about ending things and wrapping things up. So with Snowfall, I came to a, a conclusion after, was it six seasons? Six. Yeah. Season six. Season was six. So talk talk about that from from your point of view as a composer what was it like bringing a story like that that has kind of come across that many seasons to uh you know a resolution and a closure and, a, and some kind of closure you know the interesting the, the most interesting part of that journey for me was was telling the story of this character that developed from the beginning to the end and it was really rise and fall yeah. um of of this particular character um you know franklin be, like, he became what he always wanted to become and then it unraveled mm -hmm. because whenever you have that kind of you know that kind of rise there's always going to be a fall that that comes after it when when you're talking about you know darkness yes in your yeah. heart that when darkness has to permeate in your heart in order to achieve a goal, you're going to lose in the end. Um, and following that track was a really interesting thing because all along the way, I also had to keep in mind that there was this glimmer of goodness that started from before he became what what he ended up becoming. Right. And that was always really interesting to me, like trying to keep the li a little bit of light on on him but it was really interesting telling that story over six seasons because you know the way tommy schlamy and dave andron sort of pitched it to me at the very beginning was this sort of construction deconstruction mm. um as as the the idea of, of of you know selling all these drugs in south central la in the 80s and and what that was based on and how the cia was a part of it and it was this sort of big buildup and then this big deconstruction. That's what, sort of what we wanted to do with the music and what they wanted to do with the show. And I think that they they certainly achieved that. Um, that that was one of the more interesting so, sort of storytelling devices that I, I think I've ever been involved with because yeah. there wasn't a lot of music score wise, a lot of songs. We used a lot of songs, um, but the score was really used only to really press on the emotion and a little bit of the tension because it, there wasn't a lot of need to play these big television moments. And, you know, right. one of the things we always talked about as we were spotting or as we were mixing or as I was writing the score was let's not let it feel like television. Let's not let it feel like, oh yeah, okay, cue the strings. You know, here's a really sad moment. Somebody just died. Or right. there's a gunfight, cue the big drums. Like we never wanted to do that. We wanted mm. to to keep it as grounded as possible um, with a little bit of 30,000 foot view. And a lot of that comes like when you when you heighten the sense of reality, yeah. um, you get that sense that you're looking down on these characters from above so you can sort of see the whole world. Right. Um, uh, and, and that was really always the always the intention for me. And what is it like, like how do you find, I mean, get, find that balance of, you mentioned not using too much score and you didn't want to make those kind of movie moments where you're more maybe manipulating the audience a little bit more with the music. Where Where is the where is the cutoff point? Is there like a magic like percentage? Like, okay, we're now at like 25% score for this. Or we need to dial it. Like, how do you feel? How do you know, like in your gut, like this is too much and this is maybe bringing us off the ground from reality it's a little guttural. bit? It's, it's guttural. It's all gut. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's, it's, 
you know, as, as I'm watching a temp score, for instance, like, you know, there are different editors would temp the scores would temp each episode differently. Yeah. And I kind of felt like one of my main jobs was to sort of corral these, these different editors and be like, whoa, 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 this is not how we've been doing this. Let's not do it like that. We don't yeah. need music all the way all over this. We should play this all dry. And it's interesting, like as I talked about that and Dave, um, the showrunner would be on the calls and he'd be like, oh yeah, Jeff, you're totally right. Like we shouldn't, don't have music here. Let's leave it dry. We would try to, what we, what we understood was the drier we were, the more impact the score had when it came yes. in. Yeah. And we really wanted to utilize music only to really drive it home. Like really, you know, oh my God, you can't believe that I just saw that. And then music comes in. Right. Um, anytime that we felt like, oh, music was manipulating me too much, that was mm -hmm. the feeling that I was I, I would use to say, no, 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 we shouldn't have music here. It's pulling me too hard. So yeah, you mentioned, uh, so yeah, you mentioned uh, when you felt being manipulated. So I'm curious, do you have like a, because I, 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 I kind of do this too, especially if I'm editing something and I have to like, you have to like sit down and then change, like switch a switch a, like a switch in your brain, like, all right, take this in as a viewer and not as the person who is like behind it and like crafting it. How do you do that when you watch something and see how the music is, are you able to be affected by your music or do you really rely on having, you know, your director or showrunner or somebody in the room with you to like try it on somebody who did not have anything to do with like, no, no, that? I'm, I'm able to step back and be affected yeah. by, by it. Um, I, I am, but a lot of, and it's interesting because, you know, it, it, to take Snowfall, for example, like they would tempt the entire show with my own score. Right. So I, I certainly was always able to hear that and go, no, hmm. we shouldn't have that yet. Like yeah, yeah. maybe where some people might be like, okay, we're done. You know, like that sounds fine to me. I, I couldn't, I couldn't get there. It was more like, no, we really need to carve this and shape this and this is wrong here and this is not. So, but it, it does still affect me. I can yeah. be drawn in by music that I've made for a thing. Um, and that that's the guiding principle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I mean, Snowfall, like it, it's such a, I'm so happy that I was able to kind of resolve, uh, come to its conclusion and you guys creatively were able to like wrap everything up and, and it's uh, the album that is, is uh, out now that people can check out is, is fantastic. Your music, of course, always again, kind of, picks the right moments and comes in uh, perfectly like that, which I think is a great segue into uh, Love and Death, where as a miniseries, uh, you know, my wife and I are loving it. Like we're just, you know, going through and, and watching. And and I noticed again, how you pointed through, like where the score does pick its moments of where it's coming in. And I know you mentioned kind of juggling songs and stuff like that, where, you know, Love and Death does use an abundance of songs as a period piece that, you know, likes to bring in music from from that era and, and use it for scenes. And even diegetically within a scene, it will play and sometimes move to be non-diegetic diegetic and all that. So I'm curious for Love and Death, what were like, maybe we can go to the beginning since this is a fully encapsulated limited series what were the first conversations about music with and did you chat with david e kelly like who was like your kind of creative uh point for 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 this <laughs> well it's interesting i was brought on late for that project oh which, wow okay you know it, it's always a little bit of a complex situation when i get brought on late like sure. you know they're like you know we've been in process and now we we need to figure out music we don't have a lot of time can we send you all the episodes and tell us what you think so they sent me all of the episodes and I watched the first four um, and then got on a call with Leslie Linkaglider, who was the director of all seven episodes. Right, right, right. Yeah. And David E. Kelly. Um, and we talked about, you know, how to play. You know, I, I, wanna, I didn't want to make a murder score. Right. Because right. The, the show isn't about the murder. The show is a is a character study on yeah. someone. Who is lonely and in need and is just holding it together is expected to make sure everybody else can hold it together like there's all sort of the 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 character of candy was so layered so my my pitch to them was look this is not about the this is not about like 
she's going to commit this murder. This is about right. it's 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 really the first few episodes were a love story, um, and how that turns into this more sort of psychological thriller. Like at one point, she's trying to fake everybody out, but is she? What is she really believing? What does she know? And what kind of a person really is this person? Right. So I wanted to follow that. I really wanted to follow the the feeling in there and not follow the 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 actual action, you know, because the action the action wasn't really relevant. The relevant part was what's happening underneath the surface of all of these characters, Alan as well, like because Alan, um, Alan is not Alan is not um Alan is not really um He's, it's not clear what he feels about anyone or anything, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, you're not clear about how he feels about his own wife. You're not clear about how he feels about about anything, and it it, it stays clear. And I, I don't know if you've watched the whole the whole series yet, but it stays pretty clear all the way to the end that he's sort of floating and not yeah. attached to anything. Yeah. So my original conversations with them were, how can I, um. How can I tie this all together, but not beat it over the head? Like we really needed it to be subtle, but the music had to speak volumes. So it was one of those, you know, very, very, very delicate balances and how we balance that against the songs that we used. Now, this, to me, the songs were really about putting you in place and time, right? Like she's driving and singing along to a song or it was really meant to pull the viewer into a moment that that Candy was having where I was it was what I was doing was more about like what is Candy feeling or what is Alan feeling or what are I mean any of the characters like really really feeling and trying to understand of all these of all these relationships right um, so it was an interesting early conversation and because I got brought on so late I was like I'm going to just take a shot at it and see what happens. And thankfully, my first pass of the first score, you know, everybody's like, this is great. There were, you know, the the only notes were, can we start this a little earlier? Or maybe right. we don't have music here, or, you know, <clears throat> that kind of thing. That was and, where we were. And uh, we're, when, so since you did come in late, were all the songs already placed? Like, were those kind of locked in? Or were there, like, how did you navigate working? I mean, in general, how do you navigate working with like needle drops and source music and all that kind of stuff? I mean, stuff? unless unless the needle drops and source music require score to actually, you know, come out of this, come out of the song or go into the song, it's really not all that much of for me to think about or deal with. A few times where that happened, I had to really be aware of the key of the, mm. of the piece of score that I, I was writing because I needed it to work coming in and or out of a song that was being used. But most of those songs were already placed. Right. Like, do, do, do you ever like encounter like, you know, maybe sometimes they'll, for juxtaposition, they use like an upbeat song for maybe a more tense moment. And then the score has to match that tense moment. Do you ever find like that contradicts like tone? Like if a song is used and then like, I want to start doing my thing, but the shift is maybe do you need like make space between or like do you like does that ever like pop up? I'm just curious. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really pop up like that. Okay. You know, because I, I usually feel like if something is is counter, I'll just let it play. I'll let yeah. it do its thing. Like I it, it, unless something is trying to be hand in hand, like they were they're trying to do the same things. Um it it is interesting. Um it, it's interesting to try to not get in the way of yeah. that. Like two yeah. musical voices trying to get in the way of each other. It's like, well, let's make a choice. Right, right. <laughs> and was there anything, was there a specific episode or scene throughout Love and Death that really you found creatively rewarding to just kind of like bring to life or kind of you know, musically kind of like, you know, yeah, well, score? The first episode where you where you just sort of open into the show, yeah, you know, that to me was one of the more interesting parts because I got to try to find what that theme was coming in and being able to open the world up um, from a musical perspective. Um, that that to me was great. Then also in episode four, as we transition to a much different part of the story, right. um, episode four is sort of where it all sort of turns from this affair 
to the after effects of the of the affair. Um, and that was also very interesting to me. And one of the things that Leslie said, she was like, you know, I know you're writing one, two and three right now because I wrote sort of one, two and three all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And she even said she was like, wait till you get to four. When you get to four, like everything sort of shifts and turns on its head. How are we going to do that? And I was like, well, let me finish one through three. And then when I get to four, I'll figure it out. And, you know, I, I did. And what happened was it was something very subtle um, where I, I started changing keys. And as you change the key to something um, or you just change a mode, musical mode in how you're writing chord progressions or how you're writing melodies over chords, um, if I shifted that just a little bit, it sort of really made a difference in how you felt of where you were in the story. Right. And so you mentioned since you came in late and everything was kind of already completed, did, so did you watch the whole miniseries before starting scoring? Like if you got this episode four yeah. and you get, and you, like Leslie's like, hey, it's going to change there. Do you go, oh crap, but something I did now, kind of, I kind of want to go back and change that in episode two well, to- Well, no, that was sort four. of the- Sort of the point was I could do those first three episodes mm. and keep those what they were. Right. And then, okay. So I didn't. I had watched one through four. So I had seen four. I hadn't watched five, six, and seven. Mm. Um, okay. So I saved five, six, and seven for, you know, after I finished one through three. Once I got through three, I started work on four and then I watched five, six, and seven. So I sort of had an idea as to where I was taking it. Right, um, right. But I never. At, ever at any time ever wanted to go back to one two or three and be like oh i want to change that one thing yeah. you know like one moment a really important moment for me musically was when that first meeting at the hotel and yeah. she's standing there looking in the mirror you know trying to find herself mm -hmm. you know to me that was a really expositional moment from a character from the character's perspective so i really wanted to sort of join in that with music as well yeah and elizabeth olsen's performance is just like I mean, so she fantastic. Needed, I mean, so Jesse Plemons too. Yeah, but she needed no help from me, no yeah. help whatsoever. I didn't need to do anything. All I needed to do was just watch, and and join, to yeah. to uh, to really get the point across. It was but as a composer, do does a performance something like that? I know you say oh, I don't want to get in the way of that, but does a performance that strong might push you to be like, oh, you know, they're trying something like this. Let me try it like, the, or, you know, I'm curious if the performance will actually change the way you feel about a scene. Certainly. Or how to approach certainly. It. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times when I'm writing, um, you know, a performance will guide what I'm playing. You know, mm. I, I don't do this all the time, but sometimes as I'm writing a scene, I might just sit on my piano and watch and play along. Mm. And yeah. A performance might guide what I'm, what I, how, what and how I react to it. Now, granted, my writing a score is not always reacting to what's happening, but maybe right. sometimes preceding or, you know, trying to just be with the action. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't always work. But in a situation like there were moments where her, her performance was certainly guiding what I was doing. Yeah. I mean, and I th the miniseries is such a, it's, it's, it's so wonderfully shot and edited and it just feels like uh, every, every camera move is just like kind of very, very planned and everything is very meticulous. And I, I love stuff that you can tell, like the craftsmanship behind it is, is, is there. And of course the acting is, is absolutely, you know, top notch. And so, yeah, congratulations on, on love and death. It's another wonderful score from you too. Just again, the score works just exactly where it needs to. <laughs> I appreciate that. That that's, that's super meaningful. Um, you know, because it's not one of those scores that's like loud and proud. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is definitely a score that was meant to blend with the fabric of the story and, and join with her. There are moments yeah. that you you feel the music and you know, you notice the music, but most of the time it's like, why am I, what am I feeling right now? And it's right. all sort of in there in the soup. It's like the score, the sound, the performance, the visual, it's all becomes that one sort of tapestry. Yeah. And does the fact that, you know, it is based on a pretty high profile uh, case. So I'm curious, uh, you know, we've in 
as a society, we are fascinated with with true crime. We're fascinated with why people do certain things and the kind of the dark side of humanity. So I'm curious, does the fact that this actually happened and it affected people? I know the the, film, the miniseries itself is very kind of dramatized, and they express that this is a dramatization based on facts. But I'm curious if the and a lot of movies are, of course, based on 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 true stories and stuff. But I'm curious, when it is a true story, does that change the way you approach it at all, or do you just simply look at it as a a, a narrative that needs musical support and you just try to like see the characters and the, the arc of the story well it's interesting that you bring that up because i i w was just watching the show i just watched the finale when it came out last thursday or whenever it was mm -hmm. i wanted to see it and the one thing i had never seen was the prologue prologue mm -hmm. epilogue epilogue the you know the, the, the after at the end of it, right? yeah i'd never seen it and i never knew what happened afterwards and so what I would say is the fact that it was a true story and things actually happened and then they, we go on to tell, you know, tell the viewer like what happened to these characters afterward, right. it never meant anything to me in terms of how I was writing the score. I was simply telling this story that was presented to me. Right. Um, had I watched that and known, I don't know, maybe it would have affected what I did. Yeah. You know, Alan's nonplussed behavior ended with him doing some like getting married and then divorced and then married again. And, you know, that may knowing that may have may have um, affected what I wrote. It may have pushed me in a way that I, I, you know, I'm glad that I didn't let happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that the fact that it was a true story or the fact that these things actually happened albeit in a, it, it, uh, we were dramatizing it. Um, I'm glad that I didn't allow it to have much of an uh, effect on what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, that, absolutely. And uh, I'm curious, are you just, are you a true crime junkie at all? I know my wife is, but I'm curious if that, you stay away from that and just work on what was presented to you or do you actually enjoy like, re, you know, d delving to that side of, 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 our, of our weird uh, human culture? <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it's a little morbid True crime is a little morbid. You know, I don't mind working on it. I don't mind yeah. doing it. I mean, I knew it was a true story going in, um, you know, but I never really did any um, digging. You know, right. I didn't read the underlying, um, the underlying article. Yeah. I didn't really do any research into, like, what this character was actually like. Because for me, it didn't matter. What really mattered was what's... Elizabeth Olsen's version of this character actually yeah. like that was what would matter to me because that was what I was playing. So, I mean, the, there is a, a part of me that's sort of morbidly fascinated with some true crime stuff. And, you yeah. know, just in terms of like, how can people do that kind of stuff, right. but not, not, not that much. <laughs> not that much. <laughs> well, perfect. Uh, well, on the completely different side of uh, the spectrum, we have, um, Mrs. Davis, which is another amazing series uh, that you got to to join on this adventure. Um, um, so for anybody who doesn't know what Mrs. Davis is, how would you describe Mrs. Davis? <laughs> I mean, how would I describe Mrs. Davis? It is a like really batshit crazy <laughs> um, genre bending, yeah. um, tone bending piece about the fight between faith and technology you know like there on the one side there's faith on the other side there's technology but you know the 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 show is self described as that as well yeah yeah i might even say you know what the whole faith versus technology thing is not necessarily how i would like describe it on its face because i really feel like Faith and technology, they do sort of go together in this, in, in our show. It's not right. like people who are having faith in God and Jesus and all that kind of stuff, all of a sudden can't believe in this other technology, this AI. So, you know, I think that they use that because, well, there's a nun and then right. there's this artificial intelligence and they are in combat. Um, you know, at the end of the show, what you find is that, you know, their their um, their underlying desire might be very similar 
it might right. be a very similar thing. Like they both kind of want what's best for everyone. Right. Uh, and so the, the, but the, the storytelling technique, the devices used are the thing that make it really crazy. Like we have all of this different tonality. Um, and that was the most challenging thing for me, which was yeah. how do I tell this story? and not feel like I have a psychotic score, you know, something right. that has no roots. So when I, an, another project that I was brought in on late, um, you know, in this particular case, I had about eight, nine and a half weeks, I think nine, nine or 10 weeks to write all eight episodes. Wow. Um, it was very short. And, and, you know, again, another time where, I, I had to figure out what some themes were before I wrote the whole score mm. because, you know, they were like, we, one of the things that they talked about early was what I always like to do, which is how can we thematically tie all these, these crazy stories together? How do we get all these yeah. characters to feel like one thing? And it's like, well, genre is one thing, melody and themes are another. We can have these themes play in all these different ways you know for simone simone's theme you know i played you know nicely on strings and piano and then there's a rock version of it with you know heavy metal drums and guitars yeah. um and there's uh you know there there's another one where it's just played on a penny whistle um and mrs davis theme i i sort of imagined and created as a human whistle because i thought oh, it was wow. I thought it was interesting to sort of, you know, be counter to what AI really is. It's like, yeah. well, if AI's theme is actually performed by a person, you know, actually with their body, you know, in, in, in this case, a whistle, I thought that would be quite, you know, funny, interesting yeah. funny and, and kind of fun. Um, and that worked out really well. And then, of course... How does that relate to Schrodinger's character? And how do I blend those two together? How do I get Wiley's theme, who he's a cowboy, but is he a cowboy? You know, there was all these different, all these different yeah. characters and ideas that needed to sort of be filtered through um, the ears of music. Um, and that was one of the fun things. It was one of the more fun um, projects I've gotten to work on because I got to do like, you know, we were recording strings and winds and orchestra as all of the emotional content but then recording me playing these spanish guitars and recording me playing rock guitars and you know all this cool other stuff to make it all work was was a lot of fun and so when you're approaching a series like that and you're kind of mapping out like okay this these characters uh, we have this theme and we have this motif and we have all this how do you, I'm curious, like, especially with television where it's kind of spread across multiple episodes and whether it was on Mrs. Davis or maybe another series or anything, how do you keep it like in your head? Do you like have a, a board, like a visual board, like, you know, when those detectives with like red, <laughs> red strings going everywhere, like I, th this goes to act one, this is act three, we have, we hear it in act two. And I'm just curious, like to make everything like seamless and have that kind of flow, do you have to do that? Or is it just, it just, just all lives between your ears? Like, I'm curious. Well, Sometimes it lives just between my ears and and mm -hmm. then, you know, like when we go to spot things and I'm looking at spotting notes, you know, I, I'm sort of calling out as we're as we're doing things like, oh, yeah, OK, so Wiley's theme needs to play here. Right. Miss Davis theme needs to play here. And, you know, there there's also other interstitial moments that don't require thematic material, but just right. need like some underscore. But a lot of this show was thematic. A lot yeah. of the show needed to be thematic because it was so all over the map. It was the only way to keep things grounded. You know, so it was like, how do we make sure that the audience feels familiar here? Yeah. You know, because we, we, we're we inside the, the belly of a whale. How, how do we, how do we make that feel like you know, that same moment that we felt when we were on the train in in episode three or whatever episode that was. But yeah, yeah. meaning like, how are we connecting all this material? How do, how do we connect Simone's feelings about Jesus? Like we find out Jay is Jesus. Yeah. And then how do I connect that with the fact that 
Mary is inside the belly of the whale talking to Simone. Like, this is all mind-blowing. So yeah. the only way to really connect everything was to have, like, melodies that would, if not be so memorable that you're like, oh, that's that, would just subconsciously connect you to other places. Right, So right. You, you don't feel like every time you hear a piece of music, it's like, what's that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you mentioned that it is, you know, genre bending and tonally kind of very mixed and all over the place. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm curious, I always find it interesting that we, you know, I feel like the term genre, like the way we kind of try to define shows is very much kind of a little bit antiquated, kind of like, you know, back when there was a, a sitcom and then there was just the one hour drama. And now we're in this, you know, in, in our world today, like where I mentioned Barry, for instance, started, you know, as a comedy and it, it ended in the most darkest tragic existential way possible and then something like mrs davis which blends certain elements or and even love and death which has some very kind of funny moments but also dark you know when it gets dark so i'm curious um as a composer do you even think about genre is that word even a thing to you anymore it's just like whatever is the story and the scene because the genre have a like is there a i know you can say there's a comedy score there's an action score and there's stuff like that but i'm curious as today as a composer do you even think in terms of genre like at all <laughs> i mean when i when i when i write music no i don't yeah i mean there's appropriate and there's not appropriate right sure yeah um if somebody said to me like we're interested in you in doing this thing it's comedy we need a comedy score i might say no hmm. and not because I don't like working on comedies. I mean, funny is great. I like yeah. funny. I like to laugh. I like to be involved in making people laugh. But if somebody says, we've preconceived the idea of the type of music we want to do for this right. comedy, which is funny, I, I'd be like, well, I'm not the right person to imagine what that is, right? Because for me, funny is natural. Yeah. And there's nothing music is going to do that's going to make something that's not funny, funny, or vice right. versa, right? Um, so I, I really think that we've now gotten to the point where genre of music versus genre of the storytelling device, they're not mutually exclusive and they don't need to be a thing. Like for instance, Fargo, which has, very gory moments and very funny moments. Yeah, yeah. I don't play funny music, but I I do understand how the music needs to play in order to allow the funny to be funny. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that to me is interesting storytelling. You know, when I'm when I see pieces that are like, I Ted Lasso is actually a really great. Oh, um, that's a perfect example. Yeah, really Anything, perfect example yeah. of that which Tom does such a great job um, very much yeah do, doing emotionally charged music and then also music that allows the funny moments to be funny without trying to be funny right you know that to me is what makes that great comedy and also great drama right it's it's not a dramedy because dramedy to me is like oh we're playing these two sides at once and and here's the thing that I always say I'm I have this rule where if there is a scene that has drama in it and then it turns funny or vice versa, funny and then it turns dramatic, for music, you have to choose a side. You can't yeah. play one and then transition to the other. When you do that, then it's cheese ball. Then, then right. it's like cheesy. And dramedies do that. Dramedies will play drama and then they'll play the they'll play the comedy music and it'll all turn with itself. And it's like yeah. that feels um, manipulative to me. And I'd rather not be so manipulative. I'd rather be like, OK, let's play the drama and then stop and let the funny be funny. Or we can play light and funny. And then when it becomes dramatic, stop, let the drama get dark or get heavy, or whatever it's going to get. Um, they do that a lot in 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 um in lasso as well and you know we tend to do that also in fargo we tend to do that and i certainly i did that in um in love and death where if there was going to be a funny moment well i was definitely not going to play anything funny you just got to let the yeah. odd be funny right 
yeah. it comes yeah it comes through i mean yeah and that and because comedy is so much it's, it's all, not only is it subjective but it's also a lot with timing with the editing and of course the performance and that's where you can trip it up yeah and tom does a fantastic job on uh shrinking as well which is another bill lawrence show which balances you know tragic moments but becomes heartfelt and sweet and and never gets too saccharine or schmaltzy but still just you know, the way he navigates that i mean tom is yeah. super talented sure yeah <laughs> That is not an easy task. Not at all. Yeah. Especially how sitcoms have evolved versus something where Bill Lawrence did like scrubs, you know, on network versus what he's, you know, doing right. now. So it's, 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 yeah, I think it, it's more rewarding for composers these days because it is not so much like here's our act out commercial break and, you know, all this stuff, or it's just like, here's no, you know, streaming has allowed for this kind of seamlessness. There are still act structures, but like to have an episode just kind of go and not see that cut to black and know that we are, you know, <laughs> went to commercial or something. But, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I mean, uh, looking forward, you have uh, some amazing projects coming up on the horizon, and uh, I just wonder something like High Desert. I know Fargo will be coming back. So I'm curious, what else? Uh, if you can tease whatever is coming up uh, that we can expect from from you. <laughs> well, you know, High Desert came out again. Oh, that's right. It's, it, 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 it's a it's a comedy. Yes. Right? But there's heart to it. And yeah. one of the things that we talked about was like, well, how do we play the heart and not not try to be funny? I mean, there were moments they were like, we need a little help. How do we do that? Um, and again, that that happens when we we made it work, you know. Yeah, we yeah. Make it work. Um, that was fun. That was fun. That was a fun show to do. Make it's it a. Work. I mean, yeah. I haven't started it yet, but um, uh, Patricia Arquette is fantastic, and I loved her in Severance. So, I mean, and of course, being from LA, you know that area. You know, kind of what <laughs> what they're talking yes. about. So yeah. it must it must have been a fun one to to score. <laughs> it was. That was that was fun. We did that last summer. Um, and it just took a while to come out. Sometimes that's so strange. It's like I work on something a year, yeah, a year ago, and you know, finally, like it's seeing the light of day, which is which is good news. Um, but uh, right now, I'm working on Fargo season five, obviously. Okay, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Not a lot I can say about it. It's pretty sure. deep. It's deep. It's it's deep. John Hamm is. Uh, he's he's a he's such a good actor such a good character yeah. actor that it's really it's really intense and um this particular story is very it's very um it's very timely i mean it's an important story that's being told um and i i i'm always you know i'm always interested in what noah hawley is is yeah you and noah man they got it the... <laughs> when noah right, gets uh, cooking <laughs> it's interesting you know he's he's um already on to our our the next project which i'm i'm working on as well which is um alien um, that's right yeah yeah we've been having conversations about that already and that's been like wow like right mind-blowing like oh yeah it's it's you know really an intense again an intense character character study and how that's going to play is going to be oh i'm so excited i mean it couldn't have i don't think it could have ended up in better hands than no and, and his team and your and in you because like you know the movies uh have, have had their ups and downs for sure but um and then maybe we can just touch i know you can't speak on alien because it's just starting but maybe we can touch on another universe just to close up the conversation about entering kind of a musical uh or a, a franchise that's been established over decades i know you have your experience with star trek coming into that world where of course the music is so revered and you know everyone loves star trek alien i know everyone loves jerry's you know score but james Horner did something very different in aliens and and you know going to you know, ellie goldenthal in three and then um and john frizzell in four and then of course what prometheus did with, with mark and then harry and i mean so there's maybe a little bit more room to not be so you know i'm curious if, if you feel that way they have a little bit more free reign like whereas like you come into star trek and people have maybe certain expectations about what a Star Trek score should be? Well, the, well there's certainly people have expectations <laughs> about what a Star Trek score could be or should be. That That's for sure. Yeah. No, no one will speak louder than a Star Trek fan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and the thing about that is there's there certainly like thematic elements in all of yeah. those Indian movies. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing in it like the courage fanfare, right? There's nothing as iconic oh, yeah, yeah. as courage fanfare. There's nothing as iconic as Jerry's 
um, you know, mo the motion picture theme for the next generation as well. There, but what I'll say is, first of all, I find it interesting that I have worked on one project that had Goldsmith followed by Horner, and now I'm about to enter another project that had <laughs> Goldsmith and will be followed and was followed by Horner, um, which I, I find to be quite interesting because there was sort of a there was sort of a little rift between those two people um, apparently where. Goldsmith kept saying Horner was ripping him off because right. he was the, the next guy. In any case, um, you know, I think I have a little more, um, I have a little more leeway with Alien. Obviously, there are these themes that perhaps I will, I will, um, I will choose to to include. Yeah, um, we've been having conversations about what that's going to look like and what what things. Um, what things we can and will utilize, if any. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a storytelling style, um, more than For like sure. a musical motif that Noah's interested in. Um, but that that remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, it really does. I, I feel like to me, the first alien is one of the greatest horror movies ever made. Hundred percent. Yeah. The second one is one of the greatest action movies ever made. So you have these two very different style movies made by two equally incredible directors, and but and yet completely different directors. So different. You know, Aaron yeah. And, and and Ridley Scott are completely different. Um. You know, there are camps. There are alien camps and aliens camps, right? Yeah. People love the first one. People love the second one. People, it's it's pretty incredible. Like when when you get into working on on projects that are inside of these um, inside of these franchises that are so revered and so loved. Yep. Yeah. It, it's it's uh, it's daunting. Certainly daunting for me as as Star Trek was when I when I first started, and still is. By the way, still is. Still is. Yeah. Um, yeah you know um but uh, <laughs> we we will see we will see i'm very excited the scripts are incredible yeah so, i can't wait and i think aliens is uh, the alien franchise is unique because of that because the second film was such a drastic like again i guess we'll go back to genre a genre shift of like it still had horror elements but yeah go and because usually you don't see that you see oh the first one worked let's do more of that more you know you know that isolated horror thing or just you know something like that like a slasher it was a slasher film you know the first one is essentially kind of like a really good slasher movie but um but yeah the fact that that alien franchise has kind of shifted and i love also looking at the video game so i know you don't want to listen to but what stuff to pollute your mind or you know stuff like that but austin did such a fantastic job with the fire teams elite video game and kind of bring those feels in and i just love hearing what composers do with an established franchise like that and that there's so many different composers too where it's not just one person kind of overseeing it so um, i cannot wait to hear what you and noah cook up. i mean it's interesting <laughs> you know it's like there's so many different ways of thinking about it you know yeah. and we we haven't really decided yet like what exactly um we're going to go for right I, I think that you know these are these are the moments where we do make those choices and we do make those decisions and how to treat the um the characters. I will say this. Noah called me the other day and he said, with Alien, Melody is your friend. Mm. He said that to me and I was like, well, wow. that's an interesting thing because you don't always get to hear that. No, when... you don't. You want, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested how that will fit. It's, it has been filtering in, you know, like how am I going to, how am I going to let that affect what I, um, what I end up doing? And, well, then we'll have to uh, when, let's fast forward a few months or whenever it comes out, and we'll we'll discuss that. I love you know, I think last time every time we talk, you we're, you're always starting something, and we do chat like oh, I'm starting this, and these are we can't talk about it, but I'm having the first idea. I always find that the most fascinating part because it doesn't exist yet. Nothing that we know exists yet, and then you and Noah are going to go do magic, and something is going to come back. And I think that's the magic part of of what you do and what we all do, and and just like go out and create something out of nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's what we do, create something out of nothing. Yeah, well, Jeff, I want to thank you so much for, for your time today. We've covered, you know, so much stuff and a lot of your, your recent projects, and it's been so good to catch up. Uh, you know, we haven't talked in a while, so I really appreciate your time. I know you're super busy. So, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Next time you're in town, come to the studio, hang out.
Absolutely, we'll do. I'll be back in August, so we'll <laughs> Alien. We can do a nice scene breakdown in in your studio. <laughs> Perfect.